I'm going to ask everyone to uh, please take your seats. We will start in about a minute. Again, good morning, and again, welcome to, to Texas, to the city of Austin. I hope you had a great time in enjoying Austin last night. Uh, it really is a, a privilege to, to start the, the, the next, next session. It is my delight to celebrate with you the progress we've made together for this year's presidential challenge. Uh, as of today, 49 states, Puerto Rico, and the District of Columbia have committed to reduce prematurity by 8% by 2012. Thank you very much for, for that support. Congratulations to you. We are joined today by two of our partners, two of our partners that, that are leaders of uh, the March of Dimes and Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Uh, they, they are two of the leaders that help us to accomplish this goal. We are also going to hear today from two of our colleagues, states who through different approaches achieved significant improvements in birth outcomes in 2012. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Jennifer House, the President and CEO of March of Dimes. And let me tell you a little bit about Dr. House. Uh, Dr. House serves as the President of March of Dimes Foundation, and she's served in that position now for over two decades, launching national campaigns to expand newborn screening, promote folic acid education, and to prevent premature births. Dr. House has globalized March of Dimes research and advocacy programs and achieved sustained fundraising growth for their organization. Dr. House has, he has held high-level public service appointments overseeing services for the developmentally disabled. She serves on many boards, including the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, and in recognition of her many achievements, she was recently elected to the, the prestigious National Academy of Science Institute of Medicine. Dr. House will share with us today some of the many exciting events surrounding our mutual efforts to reduce infant mortality and prematurity. On a personal note, Dr. House, it has been wonderful working with you for the last year, getting to know you, and getting to know the March of Dimes and the enthusiasm of, of your members, who really have been key in moving us forward on this initiative. Welcome to ASTHO. Uh, good morning, and, and, and thank you very much, uh, uh, David. I, um, I regret that I got in uh, too late last night to attend Esther's Follies. And I understand that uh, Paul was, uh, Jairus, was uh, duly um, celebrated. Um, and, uh, and good for you, Paul. Good for, that's, you're being a, a wonderful sport. Um, so it's, uh, it's really, it's really a, a special privilege for, for me to be here today. And uh, I just wanted so much the opportunity to come and thank you personally uh, for taking on one of the greatest challenges uh, facing our children uh, in the United States today, and that's the challenge of, of, of preterm birth. Um, I, I know that your leadership can and will significantly reduce a preterm birth and will improve birth outcomes for families, uh, thousands and thousands of families uh, across the country. Now, um, it may uh, interest you history buffs uh, out there uh, to know this isn't the first time that March of Dimes and uh, ASTO have collaborated to address a major public health problem. Uh, almost 60 years ago at this very meeting, on November 6, 1953, the first president of the March of Dimes, Basil O'Connor, addressed this very gathering. He had Jonas Salk with him, and Dr. Salk described the progress he was making in his lab to develop a killed vaccine polio, uh, uh, a killed virus polio vaccine, and Basil O'Connor's job at this meeting was to request ASTO's help in organizing a national field trial to prove the effectiveness of the vaccine. And I'm very pleased to report that your predecessors enthusiastically embraced the challenge. Together in 1954, we organized hundreds of thousands of volunteers, physicians, nurses, and lay people to keep records and to keep order. We involved hospitals, schools, governments, every available resource to administer the vaccine and the placebo to 1.8 million school children. The Salk vaccine trials were the largest peacetime mobilization of volunteers in the history of our country. 
the largest peacetime mobilization of volunteers in the history of our country. By April 1955, the results were in, and I'd like to share with you a short video in remembrance of that very, very special day. If we could roll video, please. Ten years to the day after Franklin Roosevelt's death, the decisive moment. Final tabulations on the field tests are wheeled into an auditorium at the University of Michigan. Dr. Salk and Basil O'Connor arrive, as do leading scientists and the newsmen of the world. If the results from the observed study areas are employed, the vaccine could be considered to have been 60 to 80 percent effective against paralytic poliomyelitis. Then Jonas Salk with a doctor's guarded victory message. The great wealth of events that has accumulated in the experiences of so many is well represented in the report made this morning. While the contribution of some weight may seem greater than that of others in one way or another, this gigantic experiment is symbolic of the equally great foundations, both scientific, scientific and philanthropic, without which it could not have been conceived nor executed. The heritage and opportunities available to man in the 20th century are as never before in history. I can visualize a number of problems, but none quite so formidable as the field test, one phase of which is just completed. It should be possible to contemplate the future with a guarded alert and to face each new problem as it arises, trying to learn as we go from each of the experiences that could not have been anticipated. From overcast Ann Arbor, Michigan this morning, humanity received some of the brightest news in all its history. The killer, the crippler, poliomyelitis is losing the war. So today in a new century, here we are again. Science matters, public health matters, partnerships matter. Today we're working together to stop the epidemic of preterm birth in our country so that more babies can be born full term and healthy. Prematurity is a major public health challenge in the United States because we have more than half a million babies every year out of a birth cohort of four million who are born preterm. Around the world, more than 15 million babies are born preterm. Millions of those children live with disabilities because of their early birth, and on a worldwide basis, more than one million babies die each year before their first birthday. The cost of caring for premature babies in developed countries is very high. In the United States, it's 10 times higher. The cost is 10 times higher uh, for a preterm birth than for a healthy baby. The Institute of Medicine, uh, in a, I hope, now familiar uh, analysis, estimates preterm birth uh, adds about $26 billion a year in excess health care costs in our country. The good news is that a number of interventions have been proven effective. This is true even in developing countries, where simple measures like kangaroo care and better access to antenatal cortical steroids could save the lives of an estimated 750,000 babies a year. And the March of Dimes is now working with WHO, with Save the Children, and other international partners to see that these solutions are more readily available. But for us here today, a sobering fact stands out. The USA ranks 131 out of 184 countries in our ex excessively high rate of preterm birth. We have arguably the best health care in the world, and now we need to put this resource to better use on behalf of our children. In the U.S., hospital quality improvement, better consumer education are helping to eliminate these preterm births that occur as a result of elective induction and C-section prior to 39 weeks of completed gestation. Group prenatal care, maternal smoking cessation programs are also making a difference in state after state. In Kentucky, 
the State Department of Health, Johnson & Johnson and the March of Dimes, launched a community-based program called Healthy Babies Are Worth the Wait to bundle proven interventions, improve prenatal and interpartum care, and target prematurity rate reduction in late preterm births. This program, over the period of three years, reduced preterm birth in the Commonwealth of Kentucky by over 9%. The consumer education component uh, of this program has a very positive and engaging message for pregnant women. It's part of the partnership uh, package uh, that is now uh, being worked on together between uh, our state March of Dimes chapters and state health departments. And I'd like just to share this very brief video. Some of you have already seen this. This is the, uh, the PSA consumer message uh, for healthy babies are worth the wait. So if we could just quickly roll that video. Every day it's getting closer, going faster than world coaster. A love like yours will surely come my way. Hey, hey, hey. Babies aren't fully developed until at least 39 weeks. If your pregnancy is healthy, wait for labor to begin on its own. A healthy baby is worth the wait. This will be the uh, centerpiece of a consumer education uh, 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 program that will be rolled out uh, at the beginning of November in concert with Health and Human Services. But this is also part of the package that can be co-branded in your states uh, to work on consumer education uh, messages um, uh, at, at, a, at a state and local level. Let's talk a little bit about the goal, the goal that we're uh, uh, working for. This gives you the last 40 years of uh, preterm birth in the United States. What you can see looking at it by decade is that the 70s, uh, the average was about 9%, the 80s about 10%, the 90s about 11%. The first decade of this century, we hit an all-time high of preterm birth in this country of 12.6% of all births. Then we started uh, by working together uh, to reduce that rate. So the, goal, the March of Dimes board uh, has set uh, a, uh, a national goal of 9.6 or less, a, birth rate, a premature birth rate of 9.6 or less by 2020. And uh, you know we're certainly headed in the right direction today. We've had decreases in rates of preterm birth uh, over the last four years, but we obviously need to do much more. But for those four years, Let's celebrate. In human terms, it means that 30,000 fewer babies have been born preterm, and we estimate that the nation has saved about $1 billion uh, in excess health care costs uh, over that last four years. Working in concert with ASTO leadership, and particularly uh, with the leadership of, of Dr. David Lakey, our national board has also adopted an interim goal to reduce preterm birth by 8% in every state by 2014. This means that from the board of trustees down through across every chapter, every division in the country and our three million volunteers nationwide. We have adopted this goal we have a, and we want to be here to support uh, your efforts. And I would just like to take a moment to uh, recognize um, Dr. David Lakey for quantifying his challenge and providing the leadership for this goal. Was say in this day and time to quantify your goal that only takes vision, that only takes heart, but to be polite it also takes guts. And Dr. Lakey has certainly uh, provided uh, all three. And I'd also like to thank uh, publicly uh, the first state that formally, formally accepted this challenge on January 12th, um, and that's uh, Louisiana and uh, and Secretary uh, Bruce Greenstein. So I'd just like to uh, thank Louisiana. And mostly, I would like to thank all of you in this room. 49 states have formally accepted the pledge to reduce preterm birth by 8% in your states, plus Puerto Rico, plus the District of Columbia. I think you all uh, have done 
again, a phenomenal job of leadership. Thank you for your vision, thank you for your heart, and thank you for your guts. Now, it's one thing to accept a goal, it's another thing to figure out how to sustain activity and sustain the energy and sustain the commitment uh, to get there. So let's talk a little bit about our uh, partnerships. Um, uh, I think you all uh, know that uh, the March of Dimes has pledged to do everything possible to activate our partnerships at the state level from advocacy let us help you go to your legislatures and make the case for maternal and child health, quality improvement, co-branding, the healthy babies are worth the wait, consumer advertising. And our national board has also created two new March of Dimes national awards. One, the Virginia APGAR Award to recognize states that succeed in lowering their rate of preterm birth by 8% by 2014 or before. And the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Award to honor states that reach a preterm birth rate of 9.6 or less by 2020 or before. And I'm pleased to announce today that three states have already earned this special recognition. Alaska has reduced its prematurity rate from 11% in 2009 to 9.7% in 2010, a decline of 12% and they will receive the Virginia APGAR Award. Thank you, Dr. Hurlburt. <laughs> New Hampshire has already reduced its prematurity rate to the 2020 goal of 9.6 and will receive the Franklin Delano Roosevelt from the March of Dimes at our national conference in October. Let's hear it for Dr. Montero and his team. Finally, Vermont. Vermont has lowered its preterm birth rate by 8% year over year and achieved a rate of 8.4%, the lowest rate of preterm birth in the country. They will receive both the APGAR and the FDR awards from the March of Dimes this fall. Let's hear it for Vermont. <laughs> now the critical element will be to leverage and support your leadership to sustain this fight. Many of you are engaged already in very innovative and important programs. FDR's lead to the March of Dimes was place science in service to people and mobilize volunteers. You all are already working cross cabinet. You're leveraging public-private partnerships. Um, the federal government is, is supporting through Strong Start, the COIN program. You'll be hearing more uh, from Dr. Liu in just uh, a minute or two uh, about the importance. And you're also bringing business, hospitals, and insurers forward together to the table uh, as stakeholders in improving, uh, in improving uh, uh, results. Birth weights are going up. NICU admissions and their related Medicaid costs are going down. You're getting the job done that the people of your states deserve. And for this, you've earned the nation's gratitude and respect. You are, by extension, part of a global movement to improve infant health and eliminate preterm birth as the second leading cause of children's deaths for kids under five. The United Nations, the World Health Organization, uh, and others have embraced the reduction of prematurity and its consequences as an essential element of the 2015 Millennial Development Goals. State, federal, and international collaboration makes a difference. Based on estimates from the recent Born Too Soon report, we can help to prevent up to 750,000 deaths every year worldwide through broader implementation of known low-cost interventions. As a nation, we estimate that our healthcare system can reduce preterm births and save at least $5 billion in annual excess cost by reaching a prematurity rate of 9.6% or less. And in every state, you can save money, reduce disabilities, and improve children's health. Working together, we have a unique opportunity to uplift our nation's health based on your success and your leadership. Now, in conclusion, I would just like to take a moment 
to vision what your success looks like because I'd like to introduce you to some members of our March of Dimes family who want to thank you personally for your work. Asto Region 1, Savannah. Her mom is director of our volunteer partnerships. Region 2, Tiago. He's the son of a March of Dimes IT staff member. Region 3, Amadio. His mom staffs our National Ambassador Program. Region 4, Erin. Her sister Lauren was severely premature and served as our National Ambassador in 2011, but Erin was born healthy thanks to good prenatal care, a pregnancy management plan, and progesterone. Here's some great little volunteers. Region 5, Cincinnati, Brian, March for Babies Walker. Region 6, Dylan from Dallas, Texas, a great March for Babies Walker. Astor Region 7, Kansas City, Megan. She walked in her stroller, but she had a very good time nevertheless, and her mom was happy not to carry her, I assure you. Region 8, Colorado. Dalton, his mom Jenny, is a family team specialist for the March of Dimes. Region 10, little Tyler. Tyler Fisher, he is the beautiful son of Olympic gold medal gymnast and March of Dimes volunteer, Carrie Strug. And Astor Region 10, Marcus. He's a serious chap already, you can tell. <laughs> he is the son of our uh, state chapter program director in Washington State. And he has success on his mind, you, you can tell. <laughs> so, from the days of Franklin Roosevelt through today, March of Dimes has been proud and is proud to partner with you ASTO members. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for inviting me to have an opportunity to say thank you on behalf of our trustees and our volunteers and our staff from all over the country. We're here for you. Call us as we can help. I know, working together, that we will be successful. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you again, Dr. House. Uh, we were privileged last year with the, the, the video that you sent us. You made a huge impression on, on the uh, state health officers, and then you've de delivered on that commitment throughout the year. So, so thank you so much for your, your commitment and your passion for, for this area. It is now my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Liu. Uh, Dr. Liu is the head of Maternal and Child Health Bureau at uh, health, and health Resources and Service Agency, uh, HR, excuse me, HRSA, and is a longtime advocate for mothers and babies. Uh, he is also a board-certified OBGYN physician and has previously led the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality. Uh, he joined the uh, Maternal and Child Health Bureau in January of this year. Dr. Liu will share with us uh, HRSA's new uh, Collaborative for Innovative Networks, or COINS, uh, taking the best and promising policies and practices, sharing uh, are shared by our colleagues in regions four and six and moving these out to other states, learning from them as well, and he will share with us his plans for a national initiative and strategy for infant mortality. Again, on a, a personal level, uh, Dr. Liu, it's been great getting to know you over the last year and the, the, the leadership that he has provided to the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality and now to, to HRSA, uh, that you have tremendous support throughout the nation in this, this, this position that you are He's a very passionate, committed public servant, and uh, we're here to support you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Good morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm very honored to be invited to speak at this meeting. Now, I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, the Secretary's call for a national strategy on infant mortality, and also HRSA's uh, Collaborative uh, Improvement and Innovation Network, or COIN, to reduce infant mortality. But the real reason that I'm here uh, this morning, the real reason that I flew in late last night and flying out uh, right after my talk 
uh, because it's my daughter's birthday today. Uh, as I want to come here to give thanks. I want to thank Dr. Lakey, Paul Jarrett, and the staff at ASTO. I want to thank Dr. Howes, Scott Burns, and all the staff and volunteers and ambassadors at the March of Dimes. And I want to come here to thank you all. It's because of your leadership that we now are, ha have this beginning of a national movement to finally do something about infant mortality in our nation. So I want to come here to thank you personally and to ask for your continued support and leadership of this movement. But let me start with this, uh, uh, this national strategy. As most of you are probably aware, Secretary Sebelius announced in the Global Summit on, national, uh, on, on Child Survival in July that the department will be creating the first ever national strategy to address infant mortality. This is what she said. Here in the United States, we've seen our infant mortality rates steadily decline. This is thanks to cooperation between federal and local governments, community and faith organizations, and the private sector. But today we still lose far too many children in the first years of their life. They are gone before they learn how to walk or talk, before they throw a ball or give their first smile. The United States government has committed to protecting the health of our children with targeted intervention serving populations who need them most. We're focused on reducing the number of preterm births. And we've set national goal, very similar to the kind of goals that you're setting here, to bring the percentage of all preterm births down to 11.4% by 2020. Now to reach that goal, we've launched a nationwide public-private partnership to raise awareness about the importance of bringing pregnancies to full term. We've taken a family-oriented approach that educates women and their doctors on the danger of preterm premature birth. And we're funding innovative strategies like maternity medical homes where pregnant women receive coordinated care from psychological support to education on how to care for infants. We've learned that seemingly simple interventions can help reduce preterm birth among women at the greatest risk for poor pregnancy outcomes. And where infant mortality has taken the highest toll in the U.S., we're also partnering with state officials to create strategies and interventions to begin to bring these rates down. Our plan is to find out what works and scale up to the, the best interventions to the national level. And today, I'm pleased to announce my department will be collaborating in the next year to create our nation's first ever national strategy to address infant mortality. <laughs> now, this is big, okay? it's historic. The last time we had this kind of national resolve uh, to do something about infant mortality, I was still in medical school. Okay? That was back in the mid 80s to early 1990s and that national resolve led to a vast expansion of Medicaid coverage for prenatal care. Now the Secretary's announcement didn't just come out of nowhere. It really is building on the groundswell of federal and state initiatives that have been growing over the past several years. You, uh, you, you st we started with the, the March of Dimes, really led the way with the, the prematurity campaign, and then you and the March of Dimes really sparked a national movement that's now taking out off like a, a wildfire. Okay. 49 states, Puerto Rico and District Columbia have now taken the pledge to reduce prematurity rate by 8% over the next three years. CMS, CMI launched the Strong Start Initiative earlier this year. We at HRSA, with your support, launched the, the Collaborative Improvement and Innovation Network or COIN in regions four and six, the 13 southern states, uh, at which we're planning to scale up to a national initiative by next year. And I think all these efforts at the national, state, and local level have contributed to a steady decline in infant mortality, about 4% per year over the last four years. And if we keep this up, we'll be at 5.5 by 2015 and 4.5 by 2020. Imagine that, the United States with an infant mortality rate under 4.5 per thousand life births. So there's a movement that you all started that's sweeping across the nation 
to finally do something about infant mortality in our nation, and the Secretary's call for a national strategy is going to be very timely. And who better to lead this effort than the Secretary's own advisory committee on infant mortality? SACM is an independent body that really represents diverse interests and perspectives, both public and private, federal, state, and local, providers, consumers, and families, academia, public health, health plans. The committee also brings together, as ex officio members, various federal agencies that are working to address infant mortality. This diversity is what it'll take to create a national stra strategy, to move us beyond single issues or narrow interests, to create a vision that's broad and encompassing enough to be called a national strategy. Now, although SACM is an independent body that reports to the Secretary directly, it is administered by uh, the Bureau, and that's why I've been able to keep up with what's going on with uh, SACM. So while it's still a work in progress, SACM has identified a number of key strategies, major priorities for this national strategy. So first is to improve women's health before pregnancy. Now I think this is going to be the game changer this time around. For more than two decades, prenatal care has been the cornerstone of our national stra strategy to improve birth outcomes and reduce infant mortality. And federal and state efforts in the late 1980s and early 90s to expand Medicaid coverage led to uh, uh, a significant improvement in prenatal care utilization, but not a significant improvement in birth outcomes. Now, this is not to take anything away from prenatal care. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Most of us will now recognize that, that if we really want to improve birth outcomes in the United States, we have to start by improving women's health before pregnancy. Since 2005, CDC has led this national movement to improve preconception health and health care in the United States. The Office of Minority Health has also led a public campaign to promote women's preconception health through peer education in predominantly communities of color. CMS just convened an expert group on interconception care, and a, a number of states are looking at the options of uh, a Medicaid waiver, though uh, Georgia is the only state that has the uh, 1115 waiver to provide interconception care right now. And with the Affordable Care Act, okay, beginning in August with implementation of the clinical preventive services for women, millions of women will gain access to health care even when they're not pregnant, including preconception and interconception care without copay, and that will provide this extraordinary opportunity to improve women's health not only during pregnancy, but before pregnancy, between pregnancy, beyond pregnancy, and indeed across their entire life course. Second is to improve quality and safety of perinatal health care. Now, this is where I think we made the most significant progress over the last few years in reducing early elective deliveries in large part, again, thanks to all of your leadership. There is still plenty of room for quality improvement in perinatal health that can have a real impact on infant mortality, from appropriate use of 17P to uh, screening for asymptomatic bacteria or GBS to reducing central line infections in newborns, and the list goes on and on. We know that better care can lead to better outcomes and lower costs. Just look at what's happening in the state of Louisiana, just with the adoption of a few simple quality improvement measures to reduce early elective deliveries, they've been able to reduce NICU admissions by 22% in just last six months. Okay. So better care, better outcomes, lower costs. Third is to invest in prevention and promotion. This is another area that we can do a lot better, where there's still too many missed opportunities for reducing infant mortality, such as smoking cessation, safe sleep, breastfeeding, and immunization. The committee talked about new platform for delivering health messaging uh, about prevention and promotion, such as group prenatal care that strong starters testing and new technologies like text for baby. Fourth is to promote service coordination and systems integration. The committee talked about integration at three different levels, okay? vertical, horizontal, and longitudinal. Vertical integration in terms of appropriate levels of care, horizontal integration uh, in terms of service coordination, not only within healthcare, but across systems, WIC, social services, community programs, 
and longitudinal integration in terms of that continuum of care across the life course. This is what perinatal regionalization is all about, making sure that high-risk babies are uh, born in uh, uh, hospitals with NICUs that can take care of high-risk babies and high-risk moms are cared for in hospitals that can care for high-risk moms. This is what our home visiting programs is all about, making sure that there's good service coordination, not only within healthcare, but across systems. This is what the maternity care homes and birthing center that Strong Star is testing is all about, and this is what ACO and community account care uh, systems are trying to do using payment innovations to drive systems integration. Fifth is to strengthen surveillance and research. We're now in 2012, and we can't get all the states to agree to use the 2003 birth certificates. We need to standardize vital statistics. We need to improve state capacity to link data, such as linking Medicaid claims data with vital statistics. And we need to figure out how to support quality improvement with real-time data, such as what Ohio and Florida are beginning to do. And six is to promote interagency, public-private, multidisciplinary collaboration. Now, we know we're not going to win this fight against infant mortality by working in silos. And I think a good example of collaboration is the Collaborative Improvement and Innovation Network, or COIN, that, again, with your support and help, we launched earlier this year. Okay. The COIN really grew out of a letter that asked the leadership, wrote to Secretary Sebelius at a sub subsequent meeting uh, with the uh, HRSA administrator, Dr. Wakefield. So ASTEL has played a key leadership role in its genesis, and ASTEL has continued to be a tremendous partner in supporting its spread. So that meeting between ASTEL leadership and Dr. Wakefield actually resulted in a summit uh, in New Orleans back in January. And the health officers from, from the 13 southern states, and I want to just give a shout out to those uh, 13 health officers okay, they, uh, for their exemplary leadership they really brought together a team of not only Title V directors, but also Medicaid directors, uh, uh, key policy staff from the governor's office and state legislature and professional and community leaders in the states, essentially all the people who could really do something about infant mortality in their states. The state teams went to work. Uh, they worked on their state plan to reduce infant mortality. And in review of these state plans, five strategies emerged in common reducing elective delivery before 39 weeks, improving access to preconception and interconception care, promoting smoking cessation, promoting safe sleep environment to reduce SIDS and suet, and promoting perinatal regionalization. Okay. But what was also clear from that summit was that there, there was a, a, a great deal of hunger that the state expressed in terms of learning from each other. Okay. So how did, uh, Georgia managed to get its 1115 waiver for interconception care. How did North Carolina manage to build a statewide network of pregnancy medical homes? Or what was Texas or Kentucky or Louisiana doing around reducing elect elective deliveries? Okay. The 13 states shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel 13 times. There's a great deal of expertise and experiences that can be shared across the state lines. Okay. So what we thought that we would do at HRSA is to bring the whole science of collaborative improvement and innovation to help support this effort. That's why we created the COIN Collaborative Improvement and Innovation Network. Okay. And, and the COIN is organized around teams. Okay. So, so one team for each strategy. So we got five teams for regions four and six. Each team is led by a content expert, uh, two content experts from, from the region. So for example, for the elective delivery team, Dr. Lakey and Ruthann Shepard have taken the lead of that team and supported by data experts, uh, method experts, a shared workspace with a data platform that provides real-time data to drive, uh, uh, to drive improvement. And my team's been working uh, over the last several months, mostly in cyberspace, okay? but uh, they, we actually brought them together uh, for a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting in, in July, and the teams are working on their common aims, strategies, metrics, and the driver diagram. And, and, um, and these are some of the, the aims that the, that the teams are, uh, are working on. 
to reduce electric delivery uh, uh, under 39 weeks by 33%. Okay? Now, this is not just for one state or two states. This is for the entire regions okay, of regions four and six. To reduce smoking rate uh, during pregnancy by 3%. Now, I know 3% doesn't sound like a whole lot, but given how big smoking in pregnancy, how big a problem that is, this is going to be huge. It's going to have a huge impact. To improve safe sleep practices by 5%, to increase mothers delivering at appropriate uh, facilities by 20%, and to change Medicaid policy and practices around interconception care in at least five to eight states. So what's next for the coin? Well, one thing is that, that we're gonna try to scale and spread this, and again, your support, your leadership uh, in all the other regions uh, are gonna be very important. Okay. And the second thing is that we gotta figure out how to better coordinate and collaborate with other national initiatives, such as the Healthy Babies or, or, or Strong Start uh, Initiative. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, the leadership at ASTA, AMCHIP, the March of Dimes, and HRSA uh, met last week to talk exactly that. Okay. And there's still a lot of things for us to, to figure out but one thing that's clear to all of us is that if we really want to win this fight against infant mortality, we can't work in silos. Okay? We gotta all come together, public and private, federal, state, and local, okay? across state lines, across party lines, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. That's how we're gonna succeed. That's how we're gonna win this fight against infant mortality. So let me just conclude with one final thought about infant mortality. Infant mortality is really more than simply an accounting of infant deaths. It's more than simply an indicator of community health or even social inequality. Ultimately, infant mortality is a measure of how much we fail our nation's greatness. A greatness that's summed up in a simple declaration some 235 years ago, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A greatness that is made by a simple promise that everyone gets a fair shot, no matter where you're from or the family that you're born into, or the color of your skin. And the greatness that's just told in simple dreams, okay, when we tell our children as we took them in the night, that when they grow up, they get to be anything that they want to be. America gave me and my family that chance. Those of you who know my story know that my parents would never get invited to give a talk like this because they never went to college. In fact, in my mom's case, she actually never went to high school or even junior high. You see, my mom was only 11 when her father died. So as the oldest girl in the family, she had to drop out of fifth grade to go work in a factory to help support the family. So I didn't come from an educated family or a wealthy family, but that didn't matter. It didn't matter because in a great America, you don't have to be rich to go to the best schools. And it didn't matter because in a great America, everyone gets a fair shot, no matter where you're from, or the family you're born into, or the color of your skin. And it didn't matter because in a great America, I knew that if I just work hard enough and try hard enough, I can give my girls a, a better life, the kind of life that my mom would never even dare dream of. And that my two little girls, Sasha, who's nine years old, and Avery, who's turning seven today, okay, the granddaughters of a girl who had to drop out of fifth grade to go work in the factory can now grow up in a nation where they get to be anything they want to be. Okay, that's a true testament to the greatness that is America. Okay. And if my girls can get that chance, why shouldn't every child born in America get the same chance? 
if my girls can get a fair shot, why shouldn't every child get a fair shot? Yes. So this is what we're fighting for. Right? It's more than the fight against infant mortality. This is what we're fighting about, what, what we're, we're fighting about, what we're all about as a nation. Right? Now the Maternal Child Health Bureau has been fighting this fight for over 100 years right? since the establishment of the Children's Bureau back in 1912. I'm proud and humble to be leading the Bureau and to be fighting this fight side by side with me now. Right? Now, you started something great, right? something I think historic. And I don't know how it works here. Uh, I know with uh, Dr. Montero coming in and Dr. Lakey going out, and I know you just gave him a standing ovation, but I don't know if this is kind of one of those things where it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but uh, I hope, I, but, but please don't give up. Okay? So, so I'm asking you, I, I'm coming here to ask for your continued support and your continued leadership. Okay? If you believe in America's greatness, if you believe that every child deserves a fair shot, okay? please keep this up. Okay, let's keep the movement going, let's keep the movement alive, and let's win this fight against infant mortality in our nation. Thank you very much. I think you can easily see the, the commitment and the, the passion that we have at HRSA on, on this issue. And, and Dr. Liu, I want to tell you, every time that I hear you talk, I am inspired. So, 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 so thank you. Uh, one of the, the, the opportunities of being president is to be able to award the, the Presidential Mator Matoria Service Award. It is given by ASTHO, honoring outstanding contributions to ASTHO and the state's public health. Any health leader is eligible. It is my honor to confer this award to outstanding colleagues and partners that have helped move this effort for healthier babers, babies farther than ASTHO could have done on its own. It's my honor to present the uh, Presidential Meritorious Award to Ruth Ann Shepard of Title V Directors. Ruth, Ruth Ann is one of my heroes. Uh, I'm giving this in recognition to exemplary and meritorious service to ASTHO, the citizens of Kentucky, and to our nation. Dr. Shepard is an active member on the Healthy Babies Steering Committee. She is a major contributor to healthy, our Healthy Babies website, designed, and our best practices. She led the 39-week COIN Learning Collaborative on Infant Mortality at the Infant Mortality Summit uh, follow-up meeting in Washington, D.C. She works diligently in Kentucky to prevent preterm births by increasing home visiting through implementing the Kentucky's HANDS program, an intensive home visitation program for overburdened first-time parents. She partnered with the March of Dimes for the Healthy Babies Are Worth the Wait three-year pilot program that aimed to reduce preventable preterm births. The goal of that initiative was a 15% reduction in the rate of singleton preterm births at the intervention sites with a focus on late-term births. This increased collaboration between clinical and public health professionals and the local community was successful. Outcomes from this work included the C-section rate at the intervention sites increasing only 2.2 percent while everywhere else went up 11 percent. Smoking rates decreased 10 percent at the intervention sites compared to 8 percent in comparison sites. Premature, prematurity rates dropped not only at the intervention sites but also statewide in Kentucky. Because of her, her outstanding work and dedication, Kentucky experienced the largest drop in rates of preterm births of any of the surrounding states. And again, on a personal note, uh, she has been a, a workhorse in this area. She, she has led the, this charge. When we had our first regional meeting and we're trying to figure out how do we really implement this, this thought, this, this strategy, she was the subject matter expert that came to our side to help us figure out and how to navigate this waters. And I can't think of somebody who better represents the ideals that I have in public health than Ruth Ann Shepard. Uh, so as president and on behalf of ASTHO members, I'd like to thank Dr. Shepard for her outstanding service. Unfortunately, Dr. Shepard couldn't join us today. So, so Charlie Kendall, uh, Charlie, I think you are here. 
uh, he will accept the award on her behalf. Um, Ruth Ann is doing what Ruth Ann does today. She's evangelizing in, in some other state about this issue. Uh, as David said, she has been a tireless, quiet evangelist for this issue for a good number of years. And as Chief of Staff to the Commissioner of Public Health, uh, Dr. William Hacker, now an alum, uh, I was present in the room, the executive staff meeting, where Ruth Ann gave her first presentation to our staff many years ago on this subject. And her presentation was the kind that many of you have seen Ruth Ann do. Um, it was science-based, it was data-driven, and it was compelling. And as she moved towards the end of her presentation, she began to make the, the case that this was not just a Kentucky issue, that this was a national and indeed a worldwide issue, and it was something that we could do something about, and oh, by the way, it's costing us a whole lot of money by not doing something. So Dr. William Hacker did what the best shows do, he listened, he empowered, and he connected. And he began to talk to others. He talked to Paul, and Paul talked to the people that Paul talks to. And two years ago at, at this very meeting out in Denver, there was a meeting hastily arranged with David and Ruth Ann, or D David and Dr. Sh Dr. Uh, Hacker and Paul and some others from the insurance industry. They were interested. And everywhere people went, the message got carried further and became larger and became solidified. Uh, and that's the power of one person with a commitment and a cause to make change in our world. And so I know on behalf of Ruth Ann that she would want to extend her thanks to all of you for all of the work that you have done and for giving voice, and particularly David Lakey, for his bold initiative and his tireless energy at bringing this issue again and again and again. And I assure Dr. Liu this will not stop uh, after this meeting. It will go on. Ruth Ann is a very quiet Kentuckian, but a true Kentuckian. What you don't know about her is that she enjoys bluegrass music and plays a mean dulcimer. <laughs> and when she built her house near Frankfurt um, about eight years ago, she extended the, the height of the garage so that she could play basketball inside. On behalf of Ruth Ann Shepard, the Kentucky Department of Public Health, and Commissioner William Hacker, we give you thanks for this award. It, it is also my pleasure to uh, present a second Presidential Notorious Service Award to Dr. Jennifer House of the March of Dimes in recognition to her exemplary and notorious service to ASSO and to our nation. Dr. House led the partnership with the March of Dimes to support state health agencies with programs and policy changes. She has shown her support for the, the beginning of this presidential challenge and by helping announce the Healthy Babies Initiative at the annual meeting last October. She encouraged and directed the March of Dimes staff to collaborate with, stealth, with state health agencies for the March of Babies fundraiser. She shared March of Dimes data and resources to states and to ASTHO. And she and the March of Dimes will be awarding states for reducing preterm births by 8% by 2014, as she outlined for us earlier today. A again, I, I don't think we could have a, a better partner in this initiative than, than Dr. House and, and the March of Dimes. Their ability to do things that, that we can't necessarily do, that the resources that they've brought, and by making this the, the priority of the March of Dimes, uh, really moves this to, to another level. And again, it, it's been tremendous to be able to work with you over the last year. Uh, Dr. House, I'd like to award you the President's Service. I didn't know you were going to do this. I know you didn't. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I don't rarely get surprised, um, but you did that, David. Um, I, I just want to thank you all. Um, I want to thank my, my partner, my national partner, uh, uh, Paul Jarris. Um, we've, we, um, we enjoy working together. Um, it's just beginning. We still have a, a long road to go, but it's, uh, 
Uh, it's, it's very um, uh, creative and um, um, I, I think um, a productive for us to find ways to bring our organizations together where it really, really counts, which is where the boots are on the ground and that's, that's with the states. Um, so Paul, just thank you and, and your staff um, for, for being great partners and, and more to come. And David, um, you already know of my admiration for, for your leadership. Um, and for uh, quantifying <clears throat> your presidential challenge and bringing that forward and supporting your colleagues uh, in, uh, in states. Um, this is um, e pluribus unum. Um, we, we all care uh, for our babies in every community and I look forward um, uh, to continuing to work with you all so that we do reach the day when every baby in every community um, is born healthy. So thank you very, very much. I really appreciate this so much. Thank you. Again, I, th I think we've been successful because of partnerships. And, and again, I appreciate the partnerships that we've had with the federal government, with the March of Dimes, through our Title V, through AMCHIP, the, the variety of entities that, that have come together that have allowed us to be successful o over the, the, this year. So I, I know both of you have planes that, that you have to, to, to catch. Um, you're welcome to stay as long as you, you, you can. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a, a tra transition here, and I'd like Terry Klein and, and Jewel to, to come and join us. Uh, but, but I'd like to tell you a little bit of what's going on in states uh, as we try to move forward on, on this initiative. Can I have my slides, please? Again, th th thank you, Dr. House and, and, and Dr. Liu. It really has been an amazing year over the last, last year. Uh, as I've told folks, it, this has been a learning experience for, for me. As we've worked through this, I have learned you know, what uh, it seems to me what it takes to have an initiative be successful, what it takes to have an initiative successful on the, the state level if you want to get the type of support to really move the, the, the needle. But when I talk to folks, you have to have a noble cause, something that you can get folks to line up behind. And I think this is a noble cause, trying to make sure that every baby born in the United States is, is able to have a healthy, happy first birthday is one of those things that can get me up early and, and make me stay late as we try to move this, this forward. Because I, I don't want to underestimate the impact of being born early causes for that child for the rest of his life. Uh, the, 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 the challenges of being premature, the organs that are not developed, the increased sickness, morbidity that will last, uh, hopefully just for a short term, but may last the, child's, the, the rest of the child's life. The increased disability, mortality, and the impact on the family, I do not want us to underestimate that. Also, unfortunately, that's not enough to move things forward in our current climate. This is one of those areas where you not only have a human argument, but you have a economic argument, that it costs our states immensely when a baby is born prematurely in our states. If you look at the, the drivers of hospital and health care, Four of the top ten are related to birth outcomes. For us in the, the South, about 56, 60 percent of those costs are incurred from the state through our Medicaid program, and this is one of those areas in our budget that keeps on increasing year after year. It's also important, though, to, to have a strategy, to be able to say this is something that we can do. There are things that we can do that will address this, this issue, and again, I think this issue of prematurity and birth outcomes falls in that area, that there are evidence-based solutions that have been demonstrated in your states that have been shown to be effective, and one of our challenges is to make sure that we have visibility on all those success stories. So therefore, last year, we decided that we would make this our presidential initiative, and we also decided that we needed to have a specific metric to put a stake in the ground, a a vision to say that we are going to not only talk about improving birth outcomes um, by reducing infant mortality and prematurity, but put a smart goal out there to, to reduce the rates of prematurity by 8% by 2014. 
So again, I want to thank the states. Uh, over this last year, your support has been tremendous. We now have 49 states that have committed to, to this challenge, plus the District of Columbia, uh, for, plus Puerto Rico. Uh, all states are working on this, this initiative. And so again, thank you for your, your support uh, throughout the United States. Again, the, it takes partnerships to move an initiative like this forward. You have to have the, the human argument, the economic argument, a plan. But if you have that alone, I don't believe that you're successful. You have to have the commitment of partners that can do things that you can't do, that bring their talents to the table to be able to move this forward. And we have those type of partners. As, as Dr. Liu alluded to earlier, we have tremendous support in, in HHS, the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality, which Dr. Liu previously led, uh, right now is under the, the very capable leadership of, of, K, uh, of, of uh, uh, K. Johnson, I'm sorry, I was thinking of a different K as I saw K. K. Johnson doing a tremendous job in leading that, that committee. Uh, AMCHIP, Mike Frazier, I, I see you in the, the, the back. Thank you for your commitment, the, the, the work that you've done with Title, Title V, with, with the Maternal and Child Bureau, you know, the, the work that AMCHIP has done in, in pulling those best practices to, together to, to put it in a structured form that, that we can look at and bring those ideas from one state to another. That has been tremendous. And again, thank you for the, chip, for the support that, for AMCHIP and for the folks that you represent. I also want to thank the, you know, well, I also want to thank the, the CDC. I, I saw Wanda here a little bit ago. What, Wanda, uh, Wanda Barfield, many of you may not know, but, but Wanda, Wanda uh, is, is the director of, uh, at the CDC on the issues related to prematurity for reproductive health. Uh, she has been a very passionate leader bringing this issue to, to the CDC, getting the CDC's support and to, to look at how do we regionalize uh, infant care, uh, newborn ICUs, uh, bringing the, the capacity of the CDC to the table. But again, they aren't the only partners that we've been able to work with over the last year. Uh, the ACOG, the uh, Academy of, of OBGYNs, uh, they've looked at how do we look at our vital statistics data, how can we be, be smarter, and they have an initiative looking at how do we redefine prematurity, how do we have the metrics in place to make sure that we are moving forward in the way that we think that we're moving forward. Uh, CMS has pulled together their, their expert panel. NGA has their expert panel. A again, a wide variety of partners that have committed themselves to making birth outcomes, prematurity, uh, an initiative, a priority for them over the next year. I, I, won't, I want to just highlight a couple of things that, that have occurred over this last year that, that we have been involved in. Again, the HRSA support, that summit that the Dr. Lute talked about, pulling leadership teams to, again, to be able to go back to their teams and move things forward was immensely helpful. The partnership with the March of Dimes and now the, the COIN, again, putting this into a quality improvement initiative so we don't drop this, that we continue to move forward over the, the upcoming years. When we had our first meeting, it was very apparent that, that each state had their specific issues, but there was consistency across states. Uh, when we looked at all the plans and, and the, the, all the 13 plans, uh, there were four areas that were consistent, that all of us needed to look at how do we reduce non-medically indicated inductions and C-sections before 39 weeks. We all needed to look at access to care and especially the access to 17-hydroxy progesterone. How could we ensure that moms were as healthy as they could be by the time that they were, when they became pregnant, and the safe, the safe sleep issue? So all of our states are working, in the, the South are working on those areas, and we're very excited about this COIN project being expanded through the rest of the United States. Again, it's been very satisfying to hear about the work that's been taking place through your leadership uh, in your state uh, across the U United States. I have a couple to, to highlight. First, West Virginia, looking at universal maternal risk screening for the first prenatal appointments, being able to use that data then to drive improvements in health. Tennessee, the, the, the work that they've done to improve the, their breastfeeding hotlines for clinicians, for, for, for mothers. Also, it's not on this slide, but the, the, the great work that you guys are doing with safe sleep that, that I've been fortunate to be able to see. Arkansas, the regionalization of perinatal centers and, and, and expanding that to subspecialty services. Uh, Arizona, the, the work that they've been able to do uh, to really make this a state initiative. They've been out in the media. They have a blog related to this initiative. It has become a statewide initiative to move forward related to prematurity in the state of Arizona. 
Indiana has their 40 weeks of pregnancy every week counts toolkit for, for their physicians. Uh, again, has been a, a, a very successful tool for, for them as they are driving forward in this initiative. New Jersey has co-sponsored co the New Jersey Hospital Association Perinatal Collaborative. Again, by establishing that perinatal collaborative, that gives it sustainability to move forward in the subsequent years. And Nebraska working with key stakeholders to, to meet this pledge. Again, this is just a sample of the data that, that we, the, the information that we got back, but, but there is incredible work occurring through your leadership through the, throughout the United States. We have an initiative we've been working on for, for several years, our Healthy Texas Babies Initiative. Uh, over the last year, we have implemented our legislation to no longer pay for non-medically indicated inductions and C-sections before 39 weeks, uh, and that has been successful here in our state. We have outreach campaigns to promote the father's health, uh, the, excuse me, the father's involvement in their child's health before it's, his birth. We have a council now looking at how do we regionalize uh, neonatal in, uh, intensive care uh, throughout the state of Texas. And we've been putting the dollars we got last legislative session into communities based on data to make sure that we move forward on this initiative. We've done that through a stakeholder process. We have a very committed group of about 80 in individuals from the diverse components of, of the state of Texas, uh, the March of Dimes, the state agencies, our health partners, the private industry, advocacy groups, the military, all working together to make this a top priority for the state of Texas. Now I'll share with you a little bit of the data. Uh, one of our challenges was to make sure that we had visibility on the data. Uh, one of the messages that I've had to my agency is that we don't gather data for, to be health historians. We need to gather data to have real-time visibility so we can drive quality improvement. But as we're looking at our data, uh, we, again, we've gotten better visibility. We are now presenting preliminary data for 2011, and I have partial data for 2012. Two years ago, or actually one year ago, I would not have had that, that data. And as I look at that data, I see some promising signs. I can see that in 2010, our prematurity rate was at 13.3%. Our partial data for this year will be 12.5%. Hopefully that will continue. Again, we're going to continue to monitor this very closely. And as we look at our infant mortality rates in 2010, we were at 6.3%, and we've gone down to about 5%. And if you look at the, the, the red line, which is the African-American population in the state of Texas, you can see that we're having an impact on the health disparities here in the state of Texas. We've also, working through ASTHO, we've tried to put a lot of the tools together so they are available through, uh, to you. We have the website. Uh, there's other resources that are available, including commentary from state leaders, and, and hopefully this website will be a toolkit so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can go to this website and get the, the best practice data and figure out how do you implement that in your state. So if you haven't had a chance to go to the website, uh, please go to it. It's very interactive. You go to one of these four boxes, you click on it, and you have a menu that comes up with with state-based solutions to this issue, what has been shown to be of value in other states, so that you can steal those ideas and bring them to your state. So this really has been a, a pleasure to be able to be a part of this. Uh, it really has been a, a partnership, and I think it is one of those issues that we cannot let drop, that we need to make sure that we continue to, to push forward on in the next several years. What I'd like to do now is, is have um, Jill Mullen come forward and, and talk about their success that they've had in Connecticut, and then follow that with the, the success that Terry Klein has had in, in the state of, of Oklahoma. Jill? So for anyone who was at the Follies last night, <laughs> there's no bump and grind included in this presentation. <laughs> It's really a privilege to be able to present in this panel. And I have to say, on behalf of my MCH staff, they're absolutely thrilled that I have a chance to talk about what's been going on in Connecticut. Uh, when I listened to David and Carol Rattay present last year, um, when the, the challenge was launched, I said to myself, wow, what will we ever do in Connecticut? And um, part of that is because before there was the President's Challenge, there was the new State Health Officials Challenge that I inherited when I became Commissioner. 
and, and that challenge was that uh, I arrived at the same time that it was time to prepare to go before appropriations in my first month. And what I learned is that there was a budget line for fetal and infant mortality review, uh, $200,000 to try to understand the excess infant mortality in New Haven, Connecticut. And what I learned was that every year it was a ping pong ball. The legislature would put it in, the governor's office would take it out, and our staff never planned to do anything with the money because they never expected to have it. So in some of the text that they had prepared for me, which I ended up rewriting, uh, to present before probes, what they had written was, infant mortality is only a problem in New Haven County. In New Haven, where the infant mortality rate among black children was two and a half times as high as the state rate. So within that, I quickly heard about the dialogue that usually ensued, which included that the state, the Department of Public Health, and the previous administration didn't care about infant mortality and that racism was behind it. Many times, as I've talked about going to Connecticut from Massachusetts Department of Public Health, I've talked about going from an implementation state in lots of different ways to a capacity building state. And uh, my challenges as I arrived in Connecticut dealing with this issue were similar. So just briefly, and I'll say Carol Stone, who's my MCH epidemiologist, is drooling, thinking that I'm going to make you really digest a lot of epi this morning, <laughs> but I won't. So I'll, pu I'll pull out some highlights from my slides, including that, um, and these data are the data that we used when we signed on to the President's Challenge. For singleton births, the rate of low birth weight is twice as high among blacks as along, among non-Hispanic whites. And the rate of very low birth weight births is four times as high. This is the slide she told me I should decide, you know, she wants to know how you feel about looking at these trend lines. But uh, looking from 2010 and projecting out to 2012, the symbols demonstrate exactly what the rates were with the dotted lines around them, the confidence intervals, demonstrating a couple of things. One is that from 2000 to 2006, there was a slight increase in singleton low birth weights among, in the red line, African Americans, green line, Latinos, and then on, on the bottom line, white. And then there was something a break at 2006 where the trend started to go down a little bit, showing that something was starting to already happen. Uh, there were some things that were going on in the system that were already causing some improvements. But if you look at the distance between those lines, you, sh you see that the disparities are sustained across. Additionally, what we knew was that from the top chart, and I'll just call out um, a couple of things. The percent or the rate of very low birth weight among low birth weight births is 25% in African Americans. So a lot of the, the low birth weight is very low birth weight. That translates into things that David already has referred to in terms of our understanding the health associated health care costs, where you see with the average length of stay associated with normal births, low birth weight, and very low birth weight births, and the associated charges. So we, as we thought about what we could do in relatively healthy Connecticut, especially when you chose to look at aggregate data without actually looking deeper into your data to understand what the problems were, that we needed to frame our own statewide goals around the cha President's Challenge in a way that we knew had to be about more than the 8% decrease. 
and I'll just say a correction on the slide there. The uh, state rate of eight is actually 8.1%, and we wanted to achieve a 7.4% rate of low birth weight. That would be our 8% decrease. But within that, we also started thinking that if we could, particularly among the African-American women, move people from very low birth weight to low birth weight, we a might actually be making su some success, where uh, you know, technically what we're really trying to do is eliminate both. Dr. Liu and David have both already um, made reference to perinatal conceptual, um, the risk framework, which was important for us to think about because you know, we've, we talked a lot last year about work with hospitals, for example, and just making sure that people got to 39 weeks before C-sections. And we knew that our work in Connecticut had to be a, really focus on other things as well. And that a lot of the work actually tracks through not just what we do in prenatal care, but has a lot more to do with maternal health, the preconception health, health behaviors, perinatal health, and within that, what I would submit to you, the social determinants. What we've done in our partnership with the March of Dimes is uh, still evolving, but includes um, an upcoming conference this November, partnering also with the Connecticut Hospital Association around the 39-week initiative. Additionally, we are doing a lot of work educating people about the issue, and are hopeful that we may actually be a, a recipient of a Strong Start Award, but along the way are educating people more about centering maternity homes. And um, I would say moving our Medicaid agency from pre-contemplation to contemplation around the contribution of uh, their, their efforts in pay for performance. We're also, with the March of Dimes, going through, um, going to be doing focus groups to understand better uh, where women's heads are and what their thinking is about prenatal care and, and what their needs are. Additionally, though, my staff know that I have, have a habit of seeing an opportunity uh, and calling them and saying, let's apply for this, which they have taken t t as, okay, here's something else we have to do. But uh, when we talk about it, you offer a vision of what it might be. And there have been a couple of those opportunities that we, we've embraced this year. And, and I have to say we because they know how strongly I support them in this, and that's important to me. One of them was an application that we submitted last year to participate in the Partnership to Eliminate Disparities in Infant Mortality, uh, participating in an action learning collaborative to address the potential contribution of racism to excess um, or the disparities in infant mortality, particularly among uh, African-American women. We focus this in New Haven County where a leadership, a leadership team has been participating in trainings and starting to frame uh, for themselves what needs to happen in a, I'm looking at Terry Dwelly, in a very community engagement framework uh, in which the partnerships have embraced that part of what they have to do and what we have to do is be able to have the difficult conversation around racism, which most people actually uh, don't address. Um, from that, and in their second year, they will uh, create an action plan based on their efforts. We also, um, responded to the opportunity put forward by CDC and the Public Health Foundation earlier this year to um, participate in the National Leadership Academy for Public Health. And you, know, you could have applied for a, a number of things for a collaborative effort in your state. And I suggested that we um, use uh, our efforts around infant mortality and low birth weight and submit an application around that building on the strengths of the partnerships that we've al already created with our community transformation grant. So we're working in New Lon London County, which is one of our achieved um, areas, and a community transformation grant county, building on some of the partnerships that are already developed there, and 
going through a numbers of trainings and teamwork to again institute in association with local health, a local hospital, and a number of community organizations, a plan around what needs to happen in the community to improve outcomes. Uh, we just this year um, celebrated being the recipient of, um, of the PRAMS Award. So I, I think 40 states, most of us have the capacity to do PRAMS, but this um, gives us a better opportunity to really do the surveillance and the understanding that is necessary for us to once again focus on that not just prenatal care, perinatal care element of the contributors to excess mortality. Um, what I would say in general is that I could conclude with a lot of the points that have been made over the past few days. Um, one of which Dr. Marks made yesterday, which is that a lot of this really comes back to the leadership that you, you bring to the efforts in your states. You know, my challenge was to take what, uh, what were some polarizing statements in a very polarized situation and say, we can use this as an opportunity to actually say we have a collective responsibility to address a critical public health problem. And it was within that framework that we've elected to take this approach, not one in which I was going to come in today and show you more trend lines that um, are going to uh, tell you that we've already succeeded, but that uh, we're along the way. Um, a lot of times what I say to my staff, and now I say to the legislature as well, is you only know the data that you choose to look at. And this is another example of how you really need to look inside your data to understand it. Now, I'm an epidemiologist, so uh, just, you know, Dr. Lou got personal, so, so will I. My first child weighed 1,001 grams. That's two pounds, two ounces. Now, I'm an epidemiologist, so I, I knew a little bit about low birth weight, but I didn't know that that disparity, that racial disparity, was sustained even in a cohort like mine, that I could sometimes call myself demographically a white woman if you looked at my otherwise my social status beyond my race. So I, I point that out to say, it's, this is a different kind of work, it's the same kind of work that we need to do alongside all of those other medical interventions, but it's important because another one of the points that's been made over the past few days is that public health isn't going to do this by itself. It does require the partnerships. These are complicated issues, and, um, and I believe we can get there, but it's, it's going to be our leadership to dig into all those different approaches, so thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ooh, tough audience. Uh-oh. I know I'm the only thing that stands between you and the break. So I am going to move uh, pretty quickly. And let me start by thanking uh, Dr. Lakey for his great leadership. Um, David, thank you very much. I know we've talked in our Prevention Policy Committee, which um, Jill and I co-chair, just about the power of that collective voice and what we're able to do together. Great things happen individually in our states, but when we pull together in this kind of way, we really can see incredible things happen. So thank you, Dr. Lakey, very much for that. So I'm going to show you some data uh, that because we love data, right? All of us in public health love data. Of course we do. And uh, I have uh, the great privilege of working with uh, an incredible team of people in the state of Oklahoma. We have Steve Ronk, who is our uh, Deputy Commissioner for Community and Family Health, who's here with us today. So Steve, thank you for your leadership. Uh, he heads up a fantastic team, Susanna Dooley, who's in charge of our uh, MCH division. And without her leadership, we would uh, be uh, far from where we are today. You'll see some of those partners listed here on this particular slide, including the Oklahoma Hospital Association. March of Dimes have been an invaluable player. You've heard that over and over from David, just about their ability to get out front in a different kind of way than we can as a state agency. Uh, University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, Office of Perinatal Quality Improvement has also been a great partner in this process. Uh, our overall goal, and again, I'm going to fly through this, and the data that I present to you today is really not to uh, help educate you about the data, 
It really is to leave an impression with you. And I hope that that impression is that you too can bite off a piece of this big challenge and you too can be successful and you can move the needle on these issues. These are issues that we can impact in a relatively short period of time. And a lot of times these challenges in public health, we're looking at really, really huge issues that may take generations really to impact. Uh, this is one that concretely we can attack and we can overcome uh, these particular issues. So this is what we chose as one element of our approach in the state of Oklahoma, the elimination of elective deliveries prior to 39 weeks of pregnancies. So these are the non-medically necessary uh, early inductions and C-sections. Uh, the purpose, uh, really, as I just stated, was a, a three-pronged approach. It's what we are utilizing to really move the needle here. Uh, the part that I will focus on primarily, given the limited time, is around this hard stop policy. And this gets into some regional differences, and sometimes we talk about best practices, and being from a state that is relatively conservative, I'm just going to step out there a little bit, say some things that may fly in other states would not necessarily fly in Oklahoma. So when we hear about best practices, best interventions, uh, it's difficult sometimes to utilize those in the state of Oklahoma because we like to see a limited role of government and we are very reluctant to have government mandates. And so that limits many of the big uh, tools that you have available to you in your public health uh, tool chest. And so with this particular approach, we are utilizing a voluntary approach, hard stop policy, enlisting uh, voluntarily uh, the help of the hospitals in implementing this strategy. So every single hospital who participates in this is doing that because it's really the right thing to do, not because uh, they were mandated to do just that. So again, there's a lot of history, a lot of different pieces go into this. This slide is primarily to say we have no shame in uh, begging, borrowing, and stealing those other best practices uh, from other states where we can and utilizing those. And as David said earlier, you really don't have to stop, start from square one with this. There's a lot of really good information that you can utilize and that you can uh, take and, and tailor to your particular state. Some of the history for this, a lot of moving pieces. So the risk in doing a very brief presentation is you make it sound so simple, and it's really not quite that simple, as our staff will tell us over and over again uh, when we put out these goals. So a lot of different pieces to this. Uh, you can see that, including the learning sessions. It's kind of this continual approach in working with hospitals, working with staff, making sure that we have uh, physician champions, nurse champions within the hospitals, making sure that we can really uh, move the ball in that way. So through this voluntary process, we ended up with, and this number changes a little bit over time, which is a little bit of a surprise to me, number of birthing hospitals can actually go up and down uh, over a period of time. But we have 52 out of 59 birthing hospitals in our state that are participating on a voluntary basis. That's pretty remarkable. So that covers 90% of all the birthing hospitals and 95% of all births in the state through this voluntary program. So that includes a, a lot of work on our part in terms of sending information, sharing information, making sure that, that we're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, making sure that we have good baseline data. So now some of the data I'm going to show you is looking at some of the data that we have during this quarter. Uh, and I'm putting this up here. You can see there's a little highlighted part of the pie. Those are those uh, early deliveries, the inductions and C-sections without a, a documented indication. And anyone who's worked in a hospital, anyone who's a physician, anyone who loves data knows that you have to be a little bit cautious about data, right? We know that there are, and I, I'm sure that none of the other state health officers uh, have ever experienced this, but sometimes people actually manipulate the data, and sometimes they actually present it in certain ways so that it reflects more positively or negatively, depending on what you're trying to emphasize. So there's some cautionary notes with the data as well, too. So as you're driving these numbers down, and when you look at this in absolute, it doesn't mean a lot. So we'll move to the next slide. So we're looking at the first, we're comparing the first quarter of last year with the most recent quarter of this year. So the one on the left is last year, the one on the right is next year, or is this year, uh, the last quarter. And you can see a significant reduction in the number of deliveries uh, less than 39 weeks without a documented indication. So then the question is, 
our physicians, hospitals, just getting a little bit better at documenting that. So you're not really impacting that overall number. So then we look at the data and slice it a little bit differently and expand that pie to include all of the births with and without a documented indication. So it's a much bigger piece. And in case we were driving uh, those data points from uh, those uh, deliveries that did not have documentation to 39 weeks, less than 39 weeks with documentation, that would not be our primary objective. We want to bring the overall number down. So that's why we're, we're looking at this data. These trend lines are, are very important trend lines. And you'll see that this is looking at the induction rates uh, over time. Uh, the top line uh, you can see is looking, I don't know if you can actually see it, it's the number of inductions that are greater than 39 weeks. Uh, so you can see that trend line has gone up significantly, uh, about 14%. I don't know if you can actually see those numbers there. The yellow line, which is trending down, are actually the number of inductions uh, less than 39 weeks with a documented uh, indication. So we wanted to see that one go down as well, and it has gone down 26%. And then that bottom line are the, uh, is the rate of inductions less than 39 weeks without a documented uh, indication, which has gone down 65% during this period of time, 65%. Part of what we heard from the hospitals, part of what we heard from the, and when you're talking with policymakers, the policymakers are saying, well, of course you're not going to be delivering babies, right? If it's not medically indicated, why would that happen? I mean, surely that doesn't happen. But in the field, we know that it does happen. And there's a lot of pressure on hospitals, a lot of pressure on physicians. Someone says, just concretely, and these examples help, my mom's birthday is in two weeks. I really want to have this baby on my mother's birthday. And should that happen? I've got news for you. It does happen. Does it happen around vacations? It does happen. Does it happen around convenience? I can tell you this, speaking to uh, my patient, I'm going to be on duty this week. I'm not going to be on duty the next two weeks. It really is better that you wait those two weeks, but it'll be a brand new physician. I won't be here. The choice is yours. So these are very, very difficult positions uh, for patients to be in and for physicians to be in. So what we heard is that physicians in these conversations really needed to have a policy from the hospital to be able to hold people to task and be able to say, this is not my policy, this is the policy of the hospital. And they say that we cannot uh, deliver early. And then you do the whole education piece about the importance of those last few weeks uh, and looking at brain development and looking at respiratory development, all of those things. But that has not been enough to carry the day in the past. But giving that backing to physicians and the hospitals has really been important. Uh, so it's been a little bit of an educational process. So then you look at C-sections, the exact same trends. So this is really good news. This is great news. So we're seeing that increase uh, in the number of C-sections that are after 39 weeks or greater, 14% uh, increase there as well. Uh, we look at the yellow trend line at the bottom again, 16%, uh, can't tell if it's 16 or 18, 16% uh, reduction uh, in C-section rates that are less than 39 weeks with a documented indication and a 61% uh, decrease looking at that uh, without a documented indication. So part of the educational process is educating the, the hospitals and, and giving them a little bit of peer pressure. So every single month, the hospitals get this chart, uh, which doesn't identify the hospital. So each one of those bars represents a hospital. So when you get your chart, there's a great big arrow over your hospital doesn't tell you what, who any of the other hospitals are, but it gives you an idea of where you are relative to those other hospitals. And one of those is uh, actually the C-sections, and one of those uh, colors are actually the uh, uh, inductions. So you can see where you are relative to your peers. And then you hear the excuses. Well, we do more. We take the hard deliveries, all those things. So we also provide data that allows you to look at your peers that are delivering about the same number of babies that you're delivering. And we carve into that data a little bit, so we're doing those apples to apples comparisons. And again, that helps uh, our, our participants in this process. So the overall trend line over time, looking at scheduled C-sections and inductions less than 39 weeks, has a huge whopping 65% reduction over time. And what we know about these numbers as well is that we have four hospitals, only four hospitals, 
that are contributing two-thirds of those data. Two-thirds. Uh, and so we're doing special interventions, uh, specifically targeted interventions with those four hospitals so that we can really drive those numbers down. But we need to look at the outliers with that as well. This is a cautionary note, and then I have one last slide, and we're done. The cautionary note here is that, of course, we wanted to see this is looking actually at birth certificate data because you look at all this data and say, is it really making a difference? So we're looking at inductions uh, in the 39 to 41 weeks. That's the top number. This is data from the birth certificate. Has gone up 6.5 percent. Inductions in that 36 to 38 weeks is the next line down. That has gone down during this time period 1.3 percent. Uh, augmentations have gone up. This is a cautionary note. Someone comes in, they present as being in labor, uh, and they may be uh, slightly dilated. Uh, and this is one of those areas where uh, hospitals or physicians might begin to shift uh, and change their practice and then categorize differently. So we've seen an increase here of 7.1 percent uh, and a den a de in those that are uh, 36 to 38 weeks. That's the opposite trend line of what we would like to see. At one time, that actually spiked up to 21 percent, and we've brought it back down over time. But it's a cautionary note for us, and we heard from some of our peers, look out. You might see this shift, and in those situations, then again, targeted interventions, education with the hospitals and the physicians about that. Uh, so that's the cautionary note. Here is really the, the proof is in the pudding. At the end of the day, uh, again, hard facts, birth certificate data, a 7 percent increase uh, in the singleton births delivered 39 to 41 weeks, and a 10 percent de decrease in those births uh, with 36 to 38 weeks. And all, so that's great uh, data, great success. Just to leave you with this final comment, in our legislative session last year, uh, this was uh, one of the governor's priorities, reducing infant mortality in our state. This showed up on the uh, Senate Republican Caucus list of top ten priorities, uh, which was a great victory uh, to have that show up there. And at the end of the legislative session this last year, we've had three years of budget cuts, three years of budget cuts. This last year we received a million dollars uh, for infant mortality in the state of Oklahoma. So very, very exciting. Uh, we expect to see those uh, bad rates go down. So great, great success. So again, David, thank you very much for your leadership. I would also like to send my thanks to my Region 4 and 6 colleagues uh, because that enthusiasm uh, and kind of a shared mission has really been helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry and, and Jewel. I, I think what I heard listening to, to this is that you've looked at the challenge and looked at your state and looked at how you could, by knowing the state, move forward on, on this initiative and, and pull those partners, partners together. And again, you're, you're doing, both of you are, are doing terrific work. Um, I think we have a, a little bit of time. If there's any uh, questions, uh, comments, I think we can take just, just a couple of minutes uh, for, for any, any kind of comments, questions. Hi, Wanda Barfield, CDC. First of all, I just want to commend the great work that you're doing, you know, to really improve infant mortality. I'd also um, just have some questions about what you're seeing in terms of infant mortality for those infants who leave the NICU, with the particular concern being postneonatal deaths and what can be done to reduce SID suet, a work that we're doing at CDC. see if this, this works. It sounds like it does. Uh, well, this is really part of that comprehensive approach. And what we've been terrible at doing in the past is having very narrow strategic approach that puts all of our energies into one effort. And part of that's because of limited resources. Uh, so we have actually engaged around that question. I don't have data for you that is as impressive there. Uh, we have the best argument uh, aside from the human capital piece of this is we have some great advocates uh, in terms of professionals who are incredibly vocal about their commitment to improving uh, and saving children's lives. And there's no place that that is more clear than when we've got kids out of the NICU. There's an economic argument that carries the weight uh, with many of our legislators in a way that it doesn't around the compassion issue, I'm, I'm sorry to say, when they're weighing all of these different issues. And when they see the investment uh, that's been made for uh, our youngest, most vulnerable kids uh, in the NICU, 
and then they haven't seen that follow-up, I think that we're going to see that uh, sustained attention afterwards. But thank you for your work on that as well. Okay. One more uh, question. And Joel might have a response. I, I was just going to comment that the infant mortality rates are a little bit better, but they pretty much track along what I showed for low birth weight and very low birth weight. Uh, I, I would say that a lot of the other efforts that you support that we need to collaborate with our Department of Social Services and Department of Children and Family, uh, Healthy Start, uh, a lot of the other support for families. We're really trying to push this into having people think about the spectrum of social determinants what's, once again. And along the way, um, link that to the work that we do in teen pregnancy prevention, uh, thinking about interconception care, and, and having people see that this is really a Connecticut problem which is part of the challenge at the beginning is to have the state understand it's not isolated to a few population groups. Carol? Hi. Um, I, I just also want to echo, David, thank you so much for your leadership, and Jewel and Terry for your um, presentations. Uh, Carol Rattay from Delaware. Um, we're really struggling with being able to use real-time data for our perinatal collaborative. I wonder if you have any guidance on that, Terry. I was really impressed with your birth certificate data. The uh, biggest challenge and where we have all the preliminary data that you saw at the beginning on all those trend lines is data that was created using data tools from the Maryland Project uh, where we worked with the hospitals and they actually submit that data directly to us. So we get that data on a regular basis. That allows us to, and that's why I can provide you with that full quarter's data at the end of June. Uh, the birth certificate data takes a little bit longer. So we really look at that as preliminary data that has not been validated yet as we take that in, but it allows us to have that continuous feedback loop with the hospitals, and you have to have that. They need to see that their effort uh, during this last quarter is really paying off for them or not, or that they're being left behind by their peers, uh, which they don't want a little bit of peer pressure there. We're really working with them individually and then tailoring uh, data submission, and, and we have separate forms uh, and education with those providers to make sure they're submitting that. The birth certificate data comes a little bit later, and it really then validates that effort. And we'd be happy to share uh, what we have with you. Okay. Well, well, again, Terry and Jill, I want to thank you for uh, doing a, a, a great job, magnificent job. Also, I want to thank the other state health officers for your support over the last year and our partners, AMCHIP, March of Dimes, CDC, the HRSA, all the variety of, of partners that it really has, has taken to, to move this initiative forward. Uh, there's a yellow evaluation form on your, your table. Please uh, take a couple of minutes to, to fill that out. It really is important as we try to make sure that we uh, move forward and get uh, for in our planning for, for next year. Uh, we now have time for a networking break. Uh, during that break, I would uh, ask you to take a look at the ASTO booth. Uh, there's at that booth, the public policy team will be there to share some of the resources and ask, answer questions related to federal government relations. We will reconvene at 11 o'clock, at which time we will have our keynote session with Undersecretary Kikannon. Thank you very much. Thank you.